Good afternoon, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, everybody. My name is Mark Milliron. I am president and CEO of National University. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about National in a bit, but um, we only have a little bit of time. So I'm going to get into a conversation. And the conversation we want to have is around rethinking the value of higher education. And uh, I'm going to need you as thought partners in this. So we're going to continue this conversation beyond however you want to continue. We'll give you connection strategies via social media or direct connections. But it's starting this uh, dialogue around a design challenge, which I'll, well, I'll walk you through as we get into this conversation. Um, <laughs> Do not worry, I've been coached by many, many students. Um, the students have taught me that many people who use PowerPoint have no power nor a point, so I'm very careful. Um, uh, but you are going to get PDFs of this if you want it, and the whole idea is for you to be able to take this and have this conversation in your own context. We're hoping this will start a larger dialogue around the value of higher education. I know you're probably having similar kinds of dialogues around this. Uh, this is. The frame of this conversation is going to be around Two ideas and a question. Two ideas and a question. And I'm going to walk you through it. But to begin, I want you to help me with something. I need you to close your eyes. Close your eyes, and I want you picture, in your mind's eye, picture a college student. Get a picture of that college student in your head. Okay, picture that college student in your head. Okay, eyes open. How many of you, in that mind's eye view of your college student, thought of a deployed soldier? How many of you thought of a working mother with three kids? How many of you thought of a construction worker? Right? And I challenge you on this, because what did most of you think of? Give me the characteristics. You thought of your kid. But what are the characteristics? 18 to 20 year old, living on campus, going full time, not working. Okay. And if you look at the broad data in the larger higher education sphere, anybody have an idea of what that really represents in, in higher education enrollment right now? It's about 20%. Okay. And our problem is the dominant dialogue about the role of higher education is dominated by that mindset of who higher education is. So here's the first big idea. And the first big idea is you can't answer questions about the value of higher education until you question what higher education you value. Okay? Let me say that again. You can't answer questions about the value of higher education until you question what higher education you value. And this is personal to me because I come from um, a very rowdy background. <laughs> so I come from a, a family of nine kids. I have an African-American brother, Native American brother, Korean sister. In addition to that, we had 25 foster kids who rotated through my house during the time I was growing up. My mom was a special needs nurse trained in vocational education. My dad was educated in the Navy and was out of his mind. <laughs> so big, rowdy, crazy family. Nobody in my family had any idea about how to do traditional higher education. So when I wanted, when I thought about going on a higher education path, and I was doing well enough in school, I grew up in Northern California, and they had accelerated programs, remember those? Where you had to like specifically go into those programs to be able to get on college tracks. We had to sign permission forms to be able to get in the accelerated program. Well, my mom and dad, not because they didn't love me or they didn't believe in me, they just knew they couldn't pay for it, and they didn't understand what it meant. They, weren't, they did not want me to take any accelerated college-going courses because they didn't think they could pay for it. Luckily, I came from a big, rowdy family. You heard all about it. I was able to basically lie, <laughs> and I forged my forms, and I took my courses without them really noticing, right, in terms of what I was doing. But when I graduated high school at 17 years old, I didn't know what to do. I had never talked to a college counselor about higher ed. I didn't know what that path was going to look like. And you know what kind of saved me? Was a community college. Mesa Community College happened to be in my backyard. Um, and I went to Mesa Community College. I got 60 hours. I bus tables. I waited tables. I paid my way through because I didn't know how to apply for financial aid. I didn't know what it was. So I just paid my way through. And then when I got into higher education, somebody's, when, I got into, when I got into Arizona State University, somebody said, you know, you should probably apply for scholarships. I'm like, what do you mean by scholarships? What is that? And I went through the process of applying. And next thing you know, I started getting scholarships. And then I went and got, I got on a, whatever the regent scholarship was to get my master's. And I get, then I went on to get my PhD at UT Austin. But I worked the entire time, all the way through my master's. The first time I did not work while I was going to school, while I was getting my doctorate. And there I was teaching. So I was really working while I was going to school. You know what I'm talking about? 
But because I was in that model, I was in deep imposter syndrome. I literally was waiting for someone to figure out I didn't belong on that path at some point. Um, and I felt like everybody had more resources, everybody had better understanding. But thank the Lord, there was other forms of higher education. And part of what we need to think about is in that broader view of higher education, over the last 30, 40, 50, 60 years, we've had major innovators in the world of access, right? We've suddenly brought on community colleges, all kinds of alternative pathways, boot camps, all kinds of different things that you can call post-secondary education. Are you with me on this? So if we're gonna have this conversation about the family of post-secondary, we have to think about all the options that are available to students. And in particular, think about the pathways we're creating for students to be able to, to go in and out of that based on the resources they have. But it means we need to think about the full spectrum of possibilities for our students. And here's part of our challenge, is if we don't value the family of higher education, it gets very hard to talk about how we document the value. Right? And part of our larger challenge is this idea that we have differential value in terms of what this plays out. And if we can think about the broad family differently and how they interrelate. And one of my favorite things to talk about is, especially if you're talking about low-income first-generation students, they tend to stay within 50 miles of where they were born for most of their lives. They tend to experience higher education in a regional education ecosystem which means you need to think about the K-12, the community college, the university, the private and, and, and public sphere, and all the different pathways for the students on and off of different pathways throughout the world of education. That is rowdier and far more complicated. Once you do that, we can start having a fulsome conversation about higher education. If your mental model is nothing but the traditional, it's a problem. Are you with me on this? Okay, let's go to the next, um, next admonition. <clears throat> It's time to move on from debating private versus public good, the me versus the we. In the world of the value of higher education, the public good debate versus the private good debate has dominated the conversation for a long time. And that tends to focus on who pays for what, right? If it's private good, the person pays for it. If it's public good, the public pays for it. And we've been converting public funds into private student tuition dollars over the last 20, 30 years. Part of our challenge in this is we end up in this either or debate about the value proposition in the world of higher education and it's not as functional as it could be for our design and for our services and for our strategies. Let me give you an idea of what I'm talking about. It's our conversation about how we can think about something that I like to call co-thriving. And here's how co-thriving works. Okay, I'm gonna walk you through this model. And this is where I need your idea championship here. This is where I need you helping us pound it. The model of co-thriving basically talks about this yin and yang, this interplay between private and public good, between the me and we, in a very different way. Education at its core, right? If you think about the individual, Education allows that person, first and foremost, if they can get the right kind of education, to get to a level of meeting their basic needs, right? Getting to a sense of peace of mind. I can pay the bills. I can take care of my kids. That sustenance level matters. It matters to individuals. And the edu post-secondary education they get to get a certificate, to get a boot camps, whatever it might be, that, you know, to get a construction engineering you know, you know, certification, whatever it might be, something that gets them to the point where they can pay for basic needs is a big deal. Hey, do you agree it's a big deal? I want to make sure we're saying this out loud because we have to understand that's a big deal for a lot of folks. That's level one. Then you're starting to move up where the more education they get, the more power Right? The more power and the more choices they have, the more opportunity they have. And so as they move up the chain and they get more, which is one of the reasons why I love the idea of creating these pathways where students can get certifications, they can get badges, and then that ladders into degrees, which then ladder into these larger pathways. And if we can start thinking about their time with us as optimizing their credentials like with us, you think differently about higher education. The journey's not just about a bachelor's degree or about a master's or about a PhD. It's about optimizing credentials with labor market value and opportunity pathways for that kinds of students. And at highest level, that student gets to a place where they're thriving, right? Where they figure out their place in the world and their, their choice. What do they want to do in the world? Of, and what, how, what kind of difference do they want to make? And the right kind of education unlocks the thriving for the student. 
Here is our problem. We're talking about higher education writ large. For highly well, for well-resourced students, this conversation is totally different, right? When I was going to community college, if my, if my car broke down, it meant I probably needed to drop, I ended up dropping out for a semester, okay? My daughter, and by the way, I have four kids, which my mom calls a starter family. <laughs> we'll get there. When my daughter, who went to UT Austin, if her car breaks down, what does she do? She calls me. And I, I don't begrudge her that. Like, I worked hard so she would be able to have that kind of option and be able to go. She doesn't walk into higher education with level one expectations. She barely walks in with level two because that's the expectation from birth she's going to have power and choices as she's coming in. Our whole journey begins with her with thriving, right? We're talking right from the beginning. What can we do to get you to thriving? That's a different kind of pathway, right? And we need to understand there are some students who walk in at different ages and stages who are already up that chain, right, in terms of what that looks like. You juxtapose that with the societal side, right? The public and the community side. And you realize you have levels too, right? And the base level is you're able to power a functioning economy or a workforce, right? And at the worst versions of that, the worst version of this is um, on the education sphere is serfs or slaves, right? Because you don't want people educated, you want them just to do what you tell them to do, right? At the highest level, right, where people are just trying to get the workforce in the economy, they have the skills necessary to get the jobs and make the economy work, right? So it's really thinking about what that's gonna play out. Then you go level up and you're talking about citizenship and you're talking about service and contribution to the larger community, however that might be. And then when your society's really functioning with education, you can thrive. Deep cultural improvement, art, humanity, like all the kind of broader pieces you're talking about. And by the way, I think all of the arts are woven into the entire thing if you do it correctly. But you've got levels in this in terms of the conversation. And part of our challenge is we all want to get to thriving on both sides, right? We want to get thriving with the individual. We want that person thriving at the highest level for that individual. We also want the society needs to thrive. And here's where we, as education folks, thinking about the value of higher education, have to start thinking, are what are the enabling infrastructures that lead us to the place where we can start thinking about co-thriving, right? What can we do to get to co-thriving? What are the things we need in terms of, hey, maybe there's a skills, knowledge and skills conversation we need to have between these two sides that allows you to navigate the co-thrivings where I, me as an individual, can map myself up and the society can map people to it. Does that make sense? It's a different way of thinking about how we're going to kind of power education and pull it together. Now, I'm presenting this because this makes you think about what your theory of change is in education for your educational institution. That's gonna vary based on what your mission is, what your vision is, and what your, what your contribution um, challenge is, whether you're in the public sphere or the private sphere. I'll just tell you our story on this. And it's based on this core question. This core question is, what is your path to co-thriving? Like if you're working with an institution or a system or whatever it might, what is the path that you think is gonna lead to co-thriving? And part of the, the value prop, or part of the argument I'm gonna make is that we need to talk more about our design challenge that leads to co-thriving and what we think. What do we think is gonna get us there in terms of the path to co-thriving? And I'll just tell you ours. At National University is a unique university. We were founded 50 years ago by a Navy captain named Dr. David Chigos who went to work for General Dynamics. And when he was working for that large defense contractor, he was educating a bunch of graduate students who were um, working with major universities who were not getting credit for the classes they were taking. And he knew for a fact they were the same classes he was teaching in the graduate school at UCSB. And he said, this is ridiculous. And so he started working with accreditors and other people around it. And they said, sorry, it just isn't going to work. He, and one of them said, why don't you go ahead and start your own university? And he said, OK, I will. <laughs> okay. And he began National University. And to the point where he had so much belief in this, he sold the first set of textbooks out of the trunk of his car to get them to students to start this whole process. From that crazy idea to today, 50 years, 220,000 graduates, two-thirds of them diverse. It's one of the largest producers of graduate degrees for diverse students in the country, number two for doctorates. Big power player in the military. One out of four of our students are military. All of our students are working students. They were the early innovators with one course per month. And, and part of his idea was our design will be based on understanding a working student. 
trying to get a working student to take 15 to finish is insanity, right? Somebody with three kids trying to take five courses over 16 weeks, what's the likelihood life happens? Yeah, really high. So if you're gonna think about co-thriving with that student, you gotta think differently. So his mental model was, hey, let's go one course at a time. And the idea is if you do one course at a time with some month breaks here and there, you can get eight courses in a year, which is almost the same credit card accumulation if you went the other model, right? And the whole idea was to figure out another way to do it. And you only have, you only have to focus on one course at a time as opposed to five. Right? And that model kind of took off. And so now we have four-week classes, eight-week classes, and we have one-on-one -on -one models, but all anchored in the idea of how do we help the working student. Then it came into, okay, how do we work with community colleges and create pathways for transfer? How do we work with the military and map MOS training and pull that in? How do we work with corporations and map contract training to be able to figure out how that can play in? And the whole idea was get creative with how you can document learning, do deep, effective learning, document it, and create a value pathway for that learner. Does that make sense? Okay. Our basic model now is kind of this formula, which is our path to go thriving is predicated on the belief that one, we want to adopt next generation education, which is not a trendy term, it is a theory of art. The theory of this is that in education, we are constantly improving, we are learning from our traditions of our past, and we are adopting new tools and technologies, policies and practices. We wanna keep pushing towards the next generation of tools and technologies. So we began in uh, our early days at National University, we were the early innovators in the use of an asynchronous technology that really advanced education. It was something called the cassette tape, <laughs> right? But it was the use of an educational tool to be able to create other kinds of options, right? Now, um, go look at what Gloria McNeil is doing. Dr. Gloria McNeil, who leads our nursing program, she was using virtual reality to train nurses to get them ready to be clinicians during COVID. And she just, without a beat, started thinking about VR to help save their lives while they were doing clinics, you know, doing their clinical rounds. We have been at the cutting edge of VR and AR, and now we're embracing AI and figuring out how that weaves into our conversation. But it's not just about the technology, it's about how we can think, continually think about our learning and teaching model to make sure we're meeting students where they are to take them where they're gonna to need to go. We want to be about pushing the boundary of next generation education. However, all technology and new stuff without the second part is a disaster. Like we believe deeply in the whole notion of whole human education. And the whole human education idea is that we wanna help understand the complex lives of our students. Okay, our students, we call them Anders. Okay, we call them Anders because almost all of our students are parents and students. They're soldiers and students. They're employees and students. You know what I'm talking about? They're Ands. So the Anders have a different design challenge, which means we have to understand what kind of support they need. The learning model is one of it, but sometimes they need financial support. Sometimes they need family support. They need community support. They need, uh, and so we're trying to wrap the right kinds of support around students. And here's where the design challenge comes in, is it's not one size fits all. It's not that every student needs full wrap around everything. Because some of our students are independent achievers and we just need to get out of their way. They actually just don't want the bureaucracy of higher education and they want to be able to learn deeply, learn effectively and move on. You ever met those students? Yeah. And then we have some students who don't believe they belong in higher ed. And you have psychosocial issues you're gonna to have to work with. We have some students that have basic needs issues. So we have to get them the right kinds of scholarships. We have other students that need to get their academics in line to be able to roll in. So we have to understand what that student needs and get the right support to the right student at the right time. That's whole human education. And we actually believe whole human education without the next generation education. Next generation education is predicated on the idea we're gonna use whatever tool, technique, policy, practice, strategy to help somebody learn deeply and launch effectively, right? We wanna wrap the whole, edu whole human education around that. Because if you do the first one without the second one, it often feels like you're in a, uh, almost like in a military community, right? you're almost like in a, a chain gang. If you're in the second without the first, you're in a country club, right? We actually think you kinda of need both. You need the challenge and you also need the support. So I wrote, I was a part of a book project, uh, I was one of the co-authors um, about 20 years ago that was called Practical Magic on the Front Lines of Teaching Excellence. We studied close to 2,000 Teaching Excellence Award winners in the world of higher education. One of the most common unifying things of great faculty members in, in the world of higher education who are award winning was they were able to combine unbelievably high expectations with really strong support. 
right? They wrapped high expectations and really interesting talent with strong support. That combination of expectations and support took students to the next level. And the whole idea was to get focused on that. So we're on the, in, in our world at National, it is next generation education wrapped in whole human education. And here's the big thing. It's aimed at value, value rich education. In the last 15, 20 years in the world of higher education, there's been a lot of conversation around completion, right? For the last 100 years, it was about access, access, access. The last 10, 15 has been about the completion agenda. And part of the conversation in that is we've been kind of reductionistic around that because it feels like it's a checkbox, right, within this. And the challenge for that is, and I'm going to say this, and I hope it's not controversial to you. I hope you get it. Completion is the low bar. Let me say that again. Okay, students should not be leaving higher education with debt instead of a degree. That's disaster, right? And that, unfortunately, for low-income first-generation students, that's more the norm. But our goal cannot just be completion. That's the low bar. Our goal should be to help individuals, help students suck the marrow out of this experience, right? To get the absolute most of that experience however they can. Now they might have to ladder up as they do it. They might have to meet those basic needs as they're moving into the, all the way to thriving, but we wanna get them there, right? In terms of all of this, which means we have to think about the value that they're gonna get out of it. And here are three things we care deeply about. One, we think the education pathway should be credential rich. We want students to optimize the family of credentials that will give them the power to give them the, the ability to meet basic needs, have power and choices, and get to their thriving. And, and it cannot be throwaway credentials, it has to be credentials that really count. So we want them to have help curate the credentials for their discipline that make the most sense for them to get. So if they're getting that MBA and they want to go into HR, they're getting a SHRM certification, right? If they're on a programming pathway, they're getting five industry certs on the time they're getting that programming bachelor's degree. And the idea is we're giving them multiple. If they're coming in from a community college, they're getting a cert from the community college and the associate's degree, then they're coming into our program and getting another cert and getting the bachelor's degree, right? We're creating a credential-rich pathway. If they're coming out of the military, we're going to map their MOS and take that training and pull it in and give them those kinds of credentials. And the part of the idea is we want to make sure that they're constantly doing this. And we're showing those credentials as on-ramps and as off-ramps. So for example, we have students that want to get MBAs, but they also want to get a DEI certification on top of their MBA, right? So they can have different kinds of value-added credentials that wrap around that process. We think that kind of credential richness is a challenge for our, and we've been challenging our faculty and our, and our deans to say, let's look at every single pathway and optimize the credential pathway options for our students so that they can and build those in as defaults where they're getting those kinds of industry certs as they're doing it. Secondly, is connection rich. We want students, however we can do it, we want students to be able to connect with other students. We want them to be able to connect with faculty members. We want them to be able to connect with people in their profession because it is often those connections that are transformative for those students, right? And we want them to have transformative experiences, which means experiential education. We want them to have a kind of learning that, that, makes, that pushes them beyond themselves in terms of what that experience is gonna look like. Those connections really matter, because never once at a commencement, you can love technology all you want, but I've never once at a commencement heard a student stand up and say, Microsoft Word changed my life, <laughs> right? What do they talk about at commencement? What do they talk about? They talk about their mom, they talk about their faculty, they talk about their students, they talk about relationships, right? So we as educators should be figuring out how do we curate those relationships and those connections for those students as they're going through. Education is not a checklist, right? Education should be a deeply value-rich experience. So our belief is we get to co-thriving by creating a connection. And part of what we're doing with Credential Rich is we're creating this dialogue with our corporate partners, with our employer partners, with our school districts we work with. We're the number one trainer of teachers in the state of California. We have to work with those school districts to understand what they need. So we suddenly, we have one of the biggest SEL training programs on the planet because we knew that's one of the things those teachers needed when they're coming in. Our idea is to figure out what are those kinds of credentials that make sense for those students. That creating that dialogue between the we and the me creates a deeply valuable education for the students that are coming us through. So that's our theory. And so my question for you is, what's your theory? How are you going to think about co-thriving and what that's going to look like for us? And I, have, I want to finish with something that's going to talk about the design challenges, but I want to take a beat 
and let you ask some questions here because I want to pound this a little bit. I'd love to get your reflection on this, your thoughts about this. And this is where the best and the brightest respond early and often. Come on. <laughs> questions or thoughts? What do you think? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, the conversation about stackable, syncable, and connected credentials, I think that's where we've, we have to start the dialogue with our disciplinary faculty about the idea of how can they help us curate the family of credentials that will carry the most value for our students. And what we've seen is it's harder in more traditional environments. In our environment, because we're very focused on the kinds of students that we care about, we're, our faculty are engaging in this conversation. They're willing to have this dialogue. And the dialogue we're gonna have now is not just can we accept them and get them there, but can we embed them, where it's a default. They get those certifications along the way. Now, let me be clear about it with something. I remember I, d I did a lot of work on transfer for years. Uh, when I was at the Gates Foundation, we studied it like crazy. Here's part of the problem. A high-resourced, very wealthy kid who's on a pathway towards a bachelor's degree doesn't care about getting an associate's degree. You know why? Because they know they're getting a bachelor's degree. So what they really want is the low-cost credits from the community college, or they just want that one course, those three courses. A low-income first-generation kid, that associate's degree keeps them out of poverty on the, on the pathway. So it's a different again, credential rich for that student where it really makes sense. But what we know is these industry certifications and these credentials carry a lot of weight and optionality for the students we're pulling in. Other questions or reflections? Go ahead. Uh, great teachers and great student support costs money. Yeah. And the students are paying that money for the tuition. So how do you balance between providing them the absolute best you can and how much they need to pay, how much they need to take on in debt, things like that? Yeah, I think part of the design challenge when it comes to the great product, because you have to make choices about the resources. Where are you going to put the dollars? And part of the thing we're trying to make the argument as is as we curate and create these experiences for the students, we think it creates um, almost a referral virtuous cycle, right? Where they see so much value in it, you're more likely to get more and more likely to get more. But you, I think you have to deliver on this promise before you get there. And part of our challenge is, um, is when you get transactional about just getting people through, you're busy working a funnel as opposed to trying to operate it. So one of the conversations we had early on is stop talking about how we double our numbers or stop talking about how we scale and grow. Of course, we want to get bigger and we want to scale, but we have to deserve to scale. We have to be so good that more students are going to tell other students about it. If you deserve to scale and you put the infrastructure in place, you'll scale. Right, that'll happen. Um, and, and I was an early player with Global Online Academy when they were developing this, you know, their work for independent schools, early player with Western Governors University. And part of the idea was do it really well and people will tell other people and that, that cycle begins to start. So I think job one is you gotta be really good, right? And make sure you're testing to see whether or not you're adding the value on the other side. Personal to them, you're beginning to get to coach writer. And the answer in Bob's question, I would answer it, I would add another dimension. General studies, uh, you know, we think of that as content, but if you're pulling your programming, you're thinking about your life, that's critical thinking, it can be writing, it can be reading, it can be problem solving. And if we rethink general studies and other courses, not just around content, but around cross cutting, social, emotional, other kinds of Right. Again, part of the, and I couldn't agree more, part of the idea is figuring out what is going to help that person thrive, not just check the box. And so having the ability to think well, write well, speak well, connect with people, that's going to get, take them to the next level. But it's a different kind of conversation. And it's, again, it's a different design challenge because we start thinking about how we spend money differently, how we use technology differently, how we, and this is a big thing, how we navigate. Like, how do we help students navigate and make choices? How do we help them compass their way through this process? Go ahead.
And then what do you mean by college? Yeah. So I mean, the, the story here, and I remember when the conversation around trying to help more people complete, not just get into higher education, there, there ended up being this kind of straw person around, hey, you're trying to get everyone to get a four-year degree, right? And that was not the intention for anybody, that was, but it was, it was out there, right? And so I remember at the Gates Foundation, they rolled out, that, okay, what the goal is, is helping people get a post-secondary credential with labor market value. The problem is that doesn't fit on a bumper sticker. <laughs> like, that's not an easy thing to sell, right, in terms of what it plays out. But the, the, it goes back to that first question. If you're gonna talk about the value of higher education, you have to talk about what higher education you value. And think about the value of post-secondary education of different forms and sizes. Um, I was the first... That's exactly right. So in my extended family now, um, we have, uh, it was so funny. Once I got a college degree, my mom was hilarious. Well, if Mark can do it, everybody could do it. And so like <laughs> every kid got pushed to get a degree after. So we have PhDs, law degrees. We have got people with bachelor's degrees who are more, who are accountants. We have people who are, and then we have people who are, I have, you know, I, I have a nephew who is, um, probably the wealthiest of our entire family, multimillionaire, who, did, who really wanted to drop out of high school because he was going to stab his eyes out in a traditional lecture. He wanted to be on heavy equipment. So he has been in construction engineering for his entire life. All he's ever got was, in, was industry certs. He is now one of the biggest builders in Western North Carolina and radically successful. But he kept, he's, let me tell you what, he's one of the most power learners you've ever seen. Right, he just kept learning. So part of it is figuring out what do we value and, and how are we helping that person thrive? I would say Derek is thriving, right? He's killing it. And so figuring out how we create that path to thriving for that student and how we map that into the thriving for the community and we create that yin yang, that connection, which is not simple, which is not easy. So two things to finish. Um, Cause the folks back here are gonna stab me if I don't finish on time, so I'm gonna finish on time. Like what? Um, how many of you during this conference in some of these large sessions are like sitting next to people, we were just talking about this, you're sitting in these giant crowded sessions and you're like, we're doing this again? Like after the pandemic? You're sitting there going, oh wow, we're all smashed into a room together and like, oh wow, we're having a little bit of that. She just put her mask on. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> She's all like, yeah. And I just bring that up because I would argue the pandemic was an interesting moment in the world of higher education. It was a hard moment. I mean, I was at Western Governors here at National. We lost students, we lost faculty, we lost family and friends. But it was also this moment where the design muscle woke up and people got to know who their students were and what their challenges were. And it wasn't just about the academics, right? It was psychosocial, it was life and logistics. It was trying to solve those kind of problems. And the design muscle woke up and people got innovative and they got creative. And it's freaking people out that students aren't flocking all back to face to face. President after president after president is talking to me about the fact they're actually trying to push more students back into face-to-face. It's really, I don't necessarily want that. I actually want to blend. What we're hearing from our students is they actually want a third place. They still want to learn in innovative ways, but they'd love to have a space where they can have high-speed internet, they can have a safe place to learn, they can have childcare, right? And they can, but they still want to learn in an alternative format. Does that make sense? It's a different. Yeah, it's just a di instead of we instead of we work, it's we learn, right? And so that I, it's, so we're having different design challenges, and I bring that up because we've got to start getting intentional about this, about how we get to co-thriving and how we design around co-thriving. And I'll just tell you that this makes me think about my dad. So we had a hard moment in my big, large, diverse family um, in 2004 when my dad was diagnosed with small cell lung cancer. And we had this moment where everybody just kind of took a deep, because my dad was this quiet, strong guy, kind of behind my mom, very mattress-centric household, make no mistake about it, my mom ran the place. But my dad was always this kind of behind the scenes, strong person, connector within the larger family. And it just hit all of us like a ton of bricks. And so everyone started wrapping kind of love and support around my dad. And he started going through chemo and he got sicker and sicker and sicker through the chemo. And finally he made the decision to stop chemo. Some of, some of you have been through this with your own loved ones. And it was a hard decision because we were told he was gonna have to go right on hospice and like all that. 
So we made the decision to go off the chemo. And like what happens with some people, like he basically got healthy again. He, and this happens sometimes. And he, and he lived for another six months. And they had told us he was probably going to go in six weeks. But we had six more months with my dad, and my dad was back. He was kind of, but he couldn't work anymore, which was disastrous for him because he'd worked since he was 13 years old. And so he had to, like, he had to like, stay home and stay connected. But what was interesting about it was the serendipity of it is we finally got to know my dad. Because he was the Navy guy, he was the work guy, we never got the chance to know him. And so suddenly, the time to get to know my dad was at five in the morning when he got up, when he would make Folger's coffee, and you'd go come over and you'd have coffee talks with dad. And so we actually coordinated with all the adult children about who was gonna come over and talk with dad in the mornings. And so we'd come over and have talks with dad as he was going through. And it was this really kind of special time where actually I had, I mean, I was in, at that point, I was in my 30s. I had no, I didn't know all these things about my dad and I was able to have these larger conversations. I'm telling you this because um, of this point. When I step back and reflect, reflected on those coffee talks with dad, which were some of the biggest serendipity in my life to have those larger dialogues, one of the things I realized when my dad was reflecting on his life, um, the only things he talked about were the people in his life, right? People he met, the experiences he had, the lessons he learned, and the difference he made. Those were the conversations. It was those four things. It was about people, it was about experiences, it was about lessons, and it was about the difference he made. And one of the kind of realities to me was that stuff happens to you whether you like it or not. You're gonna have people in your life, you're gonna have experiences, you're gonna learn things, right? And you will make a difference, whether it's positive or negative. You're gonna make some kind of a difference, right? The difference is, this is where my dad and I had a kind of a heart to heart about this, is when you get intentional about it. Like, I'm gonna be around those people, I'm gonna meet those people, I'm gonna connect, I'm gonna have those experiences, right? I'm gonna learn that, like, and I'm gonna get, I'm gonna make sure I make that kind of difference. That spark, like, stuck with me forever. That notion of intentionality and curation and creation around those four things has just stuck with me. I say that because that's the kind of energy we're going to have to put behind co-thriving. Like we are going to have to wake up and because students are going to go to school whether we like it or not. Students are going to go to higher ed whether we like it or not. It's going to happen. The question is are we going to intentionally design it in a way where we're optimizing the thriving pathway for the individuals and optimizing the thriving pathway for our communities, especially our regional education ecosystems? And I'm going to argue it's absolutely worth every bit of our effort to think about how we can help more and more diverse students be more successful than ever before. This is a conversation worth having and I'm hoping you're excited about joining in this dialogue. And we have so much to learn from you. You all are probably doing great work. We believe deeply in the CASE method. CASE stands for copy and steal everything, right? <laughs> Many of you are doing great things already. We need to learn from you. So let's share, right? Let's share. Let's get together. This is how you can connect with us. We'd love to learn more about how you're doing it and how we can continue this conversation around co-thriving. Thanks, everybody.